While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's a certain suspicion among Lutherans, at least many of the Lutherans that I know, that celebrating these festival days of the saints of the church is suspect. A certain anxiety enters the conversation, especially when you get to those who are not as significant and there's not as much written in the scriptures about them, like Barnabas. Now, I think there's many possible reasons for, for that. One is that Lutherans are so delightfully and doggedly Christ-focused that anything threatening that focused on Jesus, well, that's suspect or even alarming. That's one possibility. Another possible reason is that observing the saints' days is something that other churches do, and we don't want to be confused with them. A third possibility that fits with the thoughts of Garrison Keillor is that many Midwestern Lutherans are just too nice and too self-effacing to want to focus on themselves. And the idea of putting all that emphasis on another Christian makes good Midwestern Lutherans uncomfortable. There is, of course, also the possibility that the observance of saints' days may lead to losing the forest for the trees. We don't want to fo- our focus on Barnabas or any other saint to reduce our focus on Jesus, our Savior. But there is also a problem by having eliminated the feast days and the saints' days uh, in our calendar and not observing those commemorations. Well, we lose what you might actually call are the heroes of our faith. It's hardwired into our nature that we look for heroes, not just Jesus, but others who following in the train of Jesus, having faith in him, then live lives of repentance, forgiveness, but also noble and good service. So having eliminated these saints' days, there is a vacuum, and we look for heroes. And so, especially as American Protestantism kind of held the day in the 20th century, then we saw the rise of the comic book industry in creating new heroes to fill the saints who had supplanted, say, the Greek and the Roman gods and those ancient heroes. We need a hero. We need examples for us to emulate and to to model. And can we do that without losing our focus on Jesus? That's the question. And I think at least in part, the suspicion about these days is well-founded. The devil, the world, and our sinful flesh have been working together for thousands of years to take our eyes off Jesus and put our focus elsewhere. But the most common alternative focus is not the heroes of the faith. It's usually on one person in particular. And our eyes are turned inward. We become navel gazers, as Luther said, staring at our belly buttons, narcissists. This is even, and perhaps even particularly, a temptation known by pastors and other church workers and those who are dedicated enough to come out on a Wednesday to an extra small divine service. You're a hearty crowd. There's a temptation among us to start to think about the Christian life in the church and the activities of the church as our own, ours to use and manipulate and control, tempted to become possessive of these things as if they're yours and they're your creation. Pastors are too. There are moments when you hear when, when I hear one of the faithful members, or the, maybe one of the more intense ones, say, this is my church, and I won't let it change. And that might set your teeth on edge. But I must admit that I'm no different, and you might not be either. I have my visions, my dreams, my hopes, my ideas of what this church should be. How often do you think of your faith as something that you can control and use and manipulate rather than a gift to you bought from the Holy Spirit for his use? How often do you think of the vocations that God has given to you as yours, something that you've done, rather than something he has given? And then you start to want to exert a little more control on them. Again, this is what the devil, the world, and our flesh has been doing, well, throughout all of human history since the fall. 
sin-broken and self-centered minds are quick to make things about you and yourself. Very quietly and subtly, you want to focus on the things that you do to the church and for the church and your place here, or maybe the way that you have done God-pleasing things in your vocations to others as husband or wife or citizen or worker and the like. And Jesus, the head of the church, might just become then an afterthought. So the problem is the saints, or Barnabas, well, it's the same with us. It's our inclination to sin. We all have that same problem. But then Luke's words in the book of Acts that we heard snap us back to reality, God's reality. In Acts 11 that we heard, the work of the church is described as men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and spoke of the death and resurrection of Jesus to the wrong people and not in the way that the apostles had wanted to the Jews. Instead, they spoke to the Hellenists, those Jewish converts, but Greek-speaking. And then Barnabas was sent by the church in Jerusalem to spy out, to witness to the events that are happening there, these crazy events that shouldn't be. This wasn't a task that Barnabas took for himself. It was one that was given to him. He was sent by the church in Jerusalem for the task. And this wasn't Barnabas' work. It was actually the church's work, right? even if it was a bit misguided. Then you fast forward, as we did, to chapter 13 of Acts, and you find something similar. There the church prayed, and the Holy Spirit said, Set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. Following that, the church did set aside Paul and Barnabas by laying hands on them after fasting and praying. Barnabas didn't get to decide what he wanted to do for the church. Instead, the Holy Spirit set him aside and Paul for a task and gave him the work to be done. That's how vocations go. God calls you and you go. Not, I think I want to do this, and then God says, that's a good idea. (laughs) The office of the ministry, in particular, as a pastor, well, this is, another, this is a place where it's hardest to learn, that it really isn't about me. You'd think it would be since I'm elevated, I'm in this pulpit, and you all get to stare at me for hours each week. But it's not about me. And it's not about my congregation, at least not primarily, or my work or my preaching or anything. Yes, it comes from my mouth, but it's not mine. It's the Lord's. It's his work. The office of the ministry, preaching the gospel and administering the Lord's sacraments. Well, there it is. It's about the Lord. It's about Christ. It's not my ministry, and this is not the congregation's work. It's Jesus' work. He's the one who brings the congregation together. He's the one that gives the congregation his word and sacraments. He is the one revealed by the Holy Spirit in the preaching of the word as the one who came as Savior and Redeemer for his church. He is the one who proclaims forgiveness of sins in his own name. He's the one that feeds you with his body and blood to strengthen and to encourage you in the faith today and always. This is just as true for you as it is for a pastor. The work that you are given to do in the congregation here, where you're a member, isn't about you either. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Whatever you do in the congregation, it is a work for Jesus, not for yourself. And whatever work that you do in the other vocations that God has given you is, again, not for you, but for Jesus. Out of love for Jesus, you love your neighbor. So, if you're a pastor or a layperson, the work that you do at home or as a volunteer or anywhere else, that's all a work of the Lord's creation given to you. It's not about you but the Lord as you serve him as a lamp and and on a stand and as a salt, as the salt of the earth. So the word of of God comes to you today and calls you to repent of your pride and your selfishness. You can actually consider St. Barnabas and even consider him a hero of sorts, one whom God has given a noble and great work that you too may be given. But turn away from the idea or the expression that this is, in my case, my ministry, or this is your service, or you're here because of the work that you want to do. It's all about you. No, 
You aren't called to be the spotlight or to be celebrated any more than Barnabas. Rather, Barnabas is given to us to spotlight Jesus, to give glory to Christ. And so you too are called to give glory to God and to speak of his truth in grace and forgiveness. That's what life in, the, in Christ's church is all about. It's about the Lord Jesus and really about Jesus himself giving you his forgiveness by his word and his gifts to you and to all hearers. As it's gift, then it's about grace. So live in that grace. If you've been self-centered or haven't, the Lord Jesus has died for you. The Lord Jesus has put you here in his church. The Lord Jesus has called you to serve him and those around you. The focus is not on you any more than it's on Barnabas, but the head of the church, the resurrection and the life, even our Lord Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Amen. We stand to confess the night.